So we were saying, oh, okay, wow, maybe we are getting this reaction to occur. Then we looked at this uh, from electrochemistry and we said, okay, electrochemistry wise, at the potentials that we're working at, it looks like ruthenium can exist from a plus four state to a plus three state. So you could get some change in ruthenium oxide and iridium obviously could go to iridium oxide. So that wasn't a problem. But the, the nice thing was it could happen at a potential that was compatible with the ruthenium oxide reaction. So we really thought we were getting this. So now we have this material and we had to test it. One of the basic test apparatus for electrochemistry is called this three electrical, three electrode cell test apparatus. And in it, you have a working electrode. That's the material you're trying to look at. You have a counter electrode, which is just a, a platinum wire. It, it, it runs the counter reaction of whatever you're trying to do. And then you have a reference electrode. Now the reference electrode is really important because it keeps a steady potential that you can compare all the voltages to, okay? The reference electrode in this case was a mercury mercury oxide, uh, uh, mercury mercury sulfate, forgive me, reference electrode. And that had a potential of about 0.6 versus what they call the normal hydrogen electrode, which is zero. So anything that you measure, you could actually say, okay, this is the voltage to hydrogen, um, hydrogen oxidation, um, which, is, which is zero, like I mentioned a second ago. Our experimental procedure was very simple. We wanted to characterize the materials. We wanted to determine some kinetic parameters of the materials. And then the last thing we wanted to do is we wanted to determine stability. So we used different tests. One of them was just simply dipping the material in acid and figuring out what potential it was. Second, we polarized that material to see how it, uh, how it performed, like I showed in the previous chart. And then finally, we did a special technique, which is called electrochemical and penis spectroscopy, which Professor Mansfeld, who's my research, uh, my research advisor, has helped develop uh, over the past uh, basically 30 years. And we looked at that and we were able to find some results. So the first plot that I'm going to show you is, once again, here's potential versus the normal hydrogen electrode as a function of applied current density. And you see four plots on there. You see the lead oxide, ruthenium oxide ball mill sample. You see our ruthenium oxide, how can you say standard sample? That's what we use as our standard. And then you see this lead doped ruthenium oxide and this iridium doped uh, ruthenium oxide. And we were pretty excited. We actually saw the trends that we thought we would see. The ball mill sample didn't work so well. The ruthenium oxide worked as you would find in the literature, so that was pretty good. But this iridium doped ruthenium oxide worked really well. We we're very happy with that. As we had mentioned in the uh, previous, we looked. Like this, was, this is going to be some big catalyst, but what was even more amazing was that this lead doped ruthenium oxide also worked really well. Not as good as the iridium, but as you all know, lead is very cheap. So it's a way that you could actually use this terrestrially. So you could approach this problem in two ways. You could either make it very cheap to purchase, or you can make it super efficient so you don't need such a large system to make it run. The bottom line was this. There's another thing that we want to point out here, and that's the slope of these polarization curves. Not where they start to curve, but basically where, they, where they're linear. And one of the things that we noticed was the ruthenium oxide had the steepest polarization slope, the lead ruthenium oxide was next, iridium doped ruthenium oxide was next, and the lead doped ruthenium oxide was next. And we'll explain this in a second, what this actually means. One of the techniques that we used, and this is what I'm doing most of my PhD work on, is at least trying to understand, is this technique of electrochemical and penis spectroscopy. Now what's really interesting here is that you hold your material, so your working electrode at a certain potential, and usually this is an oxygen evolution potential, so this is something like 1.4, 1.4 volts or something like this, and you get this frequency response. Now, looking at this data, you kind of say, okay, what is this? You hear, here you have almost percent of your squared as a function of frequency, and here you have the uh, phase angle as a function of frequency, and you see a couple of things. The first thing that you see is you see that you actually get two time constants in your material. Now, this is really rare, because in these catalysts, you should only get one time constant, so we were kind of scratching our heads about that. The second thing is you got to figure out what part is happening from the catalyst and what part's happening from your substrate. So we went ahead and we separated the effects from the substrate and the effects from the catalyst. And we came up with this two time constant model, which essentially said that the resistant polarization, this is the polarization of the electrochemical reaction that's happening, is basically told by this uh, portion of the curve here. Your resistance polarization of your substrate is actually told by this, by this section. Your resistance of your solution is told by this section. Okay. So we had this two time constant model. We verified it by, very, uh, by various other techniques to determine that this was actually pretty good. And then we figured out, okay, these must be uh, related to the substrate and these must be related to the, uh, to the catalyst itself. So after having gone through a bunch of different catalysts, and this is just a, a small sampling of everything that we looked at, we were able to find these different parameters. One, TAFL slope. This is your polarization slope that I had mentioned about a little earlier. The shallower that slope, the better your catalyst is going to go, right? Because it's moving slower and slower as you're pulling more and more current from the system, or pushing more current in, in this case. This polarization resistance value, which is pretty nice, and this double layer capacitance value that you get from the model. What's really interesting about this double layer capacitance value is it's 
kind of a quantification of the actual surface area of the material that you're measuring. Now you can measure surface area from various techniques, but to determine the surface area of something that's actually working is quite hard, and EIS is very good at doing this. The bottom line is, the lower your resistance polarization, the higher your double layer capacitance, the better the catalyst you're going to have. And once again, this through all our processing, we showed that the iridium in somewhere around the 12% concentration range was pretty much the best material. And second was our lead. And also, as you can see, around the 7.5% concentration range was pretty much good. And as we knew before, the uh, uh, lead oxide, ruthenium oxide, ball mill stuff, well, it wasn't very good at all. And you saw that actually in the plots. And what's really interesting here is if we look at this slope, and this is pretty consistent over several runs, the ruthenium oxide catalyst registered around a 70 millivolt per decade slope, and this is in that kinetic region that we were talking about. But as soon as you add a little lead, it actually brings that value down, which is quite interesting. And the other thing that we want to show is your iridium actually brought it down to the 50s, but your lead, if we did it from this technique, brought it all the way down to the 40s. Remember, you want to get that value as low as you possibly can. So we took the materials, and I actually showed this because we were talking about this ruthenium oxide, and I was trying to mention how unstable it is, and this is the beauty of the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy technique. As you can see, initial performance, remember I'm saying going down the direction here on your potential versus applied current density curve is better. Initial performance of ruthenium oxide is great, but after a few cycles, it's not so good. And with, it really shows up really nicely with your EIS, because you can see if we look at our resistance polarization, it actually moves up by almost an order of magnitude essentially, after polarization. So it really shows this very nicely, and you can also tell that the time constants move around. So there's quite a bit of change. This is typical for all materials that aren't stable, studied in this. Now also, what's interesting, if you look at materials that are stable, and here you have initial performance and final performance, pretty much right on top of each other as far as reproducibility goes, you can also see that in your electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. So this tool was really good at determining stuff like stability, and also really good at determining stuff like performance. So we were very excited we were able to develop this for this particular catalyst. So now coming toward the end of my presentation here, one of the things that I want to point out is now we took the catalyst and we said, okay, we discovered this in the lab, why don't we try to apply it to real world? And what we have here is we took different concentrations. This is a, a, a plot of cell voltage as a function of iridium doping concentration, going from zero all the way to 100, and we got some values like 5%, which is what we were shooting for, 9%, 12%, 20%, 40%, and we can see very nicely at different potentials, and this is at, or at different current densities, the amount of hydrogen you're trying to generate from the system, you can see that around 9%, 9, 10% 9, is exactly where you want to be as far as your doping concentration goes. Now, the best catalyst in the in industry is this iridium ruthenium oxide, and this is from a vendor, so this is, we're trying to compare ourselves to what the best, best of the industry could do, and we can actually beat them at current densities as high as 200 milliamps per centimeter squared all the way to several amps per centimeter squared. We had around a 35 millivolt decrease in what we call our overpotential for oxygen evolution. This means that your efficiency is better, your system can get smaller, even though it's only 35 millivolts, believe it or not, it's actually quite, quite a big impact. 